the work that I'm presenting to you all today is um, part of a short book project that I'm writing on the foundations of general relativity. And this will be a part of the chapter on energy and general relativity. That's just to say that uh, it's all kind of a bit of a work in progress. So I'm interested in discussing it with you uh, and getting your feedback and hoping that the feedback can lead to some improvements in my ideas. So here's the outline of what I'd like to talk about. In the first part of the talk, I'd like to talk about the, you know, the evidence that we have very briefly for gravitational waves and the thought experiments that go into um, describing what sorts of effects that they have uh, on physical phenomena, talking about the usual lessons that are drawn uh, from gravitational waves about energy in general relativity. There are two types of observation involved in this, direct and indirect observation, sometimes called direct detection and indirect detection. Um, there's some interesting literature on what this distinction is supposed to be. I'm not gonna talk about it so much, but I will refer to it uh, when I talk about these different examples. But roughly speaking, direct detection involves um, an interaction between a gravitational wave uh, and a detector on Earth, whereas indirect, indirect detection or observation only involves um, measurement of a common cause of gravitational waves and some phenomena that we uh, observe on the Earth. I'm gonna draw different sorts of lessons from both of these sorts of cases, both from direct observation and indirect observation. Um, that said, there are some other folks who have also drawn lessons about the nature of energy from gravitational no waves, but I think that some of these lessons go a bit too far. So in the last section, I'm going to talk about some non-lessons, uh, or maybe just one or two non-lessons. Uh, in particular, the general failure of your energy conservation, which is sometimes seen as a consequence of gravitational waves, but one that I, I don't hold to. And I'm going to explain why that's a non-lesson on my view. So let's get started with the indirect and direct observation of gravitational waves and the usual lessons that people draw from them. So in the modern analysis of gravitational waves, gravitational waves in the far field regime, that is far away from, from their source, uh, have two sorts of polarizations. The two sorts of polarizations uh, enact two sorts of motions on test particles or particles that are massive and so as it were, have their space-time trajectories um, uh, affected by the curvature of space and time, uh, but uh, whose effect on space-time curvature is neglected for the purposes of analysis. We imagine a situation where gravitational waves are passing through the screen, and uh, uh, in the plane of the screen, there is a ring of, of test particles. Um, what the gravitational waves do is they compress uh, the circle of particles, much like you would expect a rubber ball to behave if you compressed it. It's um, uh, the natural motion of the particles um, come, come together along one axis. That's to say there is some relative acceleration between them. Um, and there's some relative acceleration between the ones in the perpendicular axis, but away in the opposite direction. And this alternates back and forth as the wave passes through. The second polarization for the gravitational waves has the same sort of effect, but the orientation of the motion is at a 45 degree angle. So roughly speaking, if you want to have a mental image for the effects of gravitational waves on test particles, very light particles, um, then uh, you can imagine this sort of picture, a sort of uh, wobbling oscillation, almost as if the test particles were on the edges of a ball rubber ball that is being compressed in one direction and then another. Okay, so one of the things that is interesting about the history of this is that it actually took quite a very long time for the relativity community to come to a consensus about this. There was a long time, and I'm not gonna go into the details so much, but there was for a long time, a lot of discussion about whether or not gravitational waves were mere coordinate phenomena. That is to say, uh, the oscillations described whether or not they were just things that appeared in our description of the world rather than being real changes in, the, in, uh, in, in matter themselves. 
one of the arguments that convinced folks um, in the kind of mid-century renaissance of general relativity it was an argument that was developed by Hermann Bondi and independently by Richard Feynman, sometimes called the Feynman sticky bead argument. The idea with the sticky bead argument is the following. You've got a bar that's fairly rigid with, uh, but that exerts friction on two beads that can slide along it. The gravitational wave passes through and through this oscillatory um, uh, behavior that I showed you just on this previous slide here, the beads um, have a natural tendency to slide back and forth. As they slide back and forth, they generate friction in the bar, and the bar increases in temperature due to the friction. The idea is that if something can increase something else's temperature, impart heat to it, then it's got to be real. The underlying idea here is that changes in energy can only be induced by real things. Energy here is a sufficient criteria for, or transformation or transference of energy is considered on this, on this sort of view, a sufficient criterion for the reality of something. Now, uh, passing from this historical episode, um, the first indirect evidence that we had for gravitational waves comes from the so-called Hulse-Taylor binary systems which was discovered in the 1970s. In, in this system that's depicted here in a cartoon, there's a, a pulsar, a rapidly rotating uh, type of uh, neutron star, usually that emits radio pulses along its um, azimuthal axis here. And it's a binary system in that it has a companion that, and they rotate about one another. As they rotate, the pulsar emits radio pulses that uh, luckily point towards the Earth. And as it does its rotation, the radio pulses uh, move towards and away from uh, the Earth, and that relative motion allows us to track the orbit of the pulsar, even though it's very far away. It allows us in particular to track whether or not the orbit is stable over time. One of the predictions of general relativity is that in a system like this, the uh, orbits of the two binary systems will ever so slightly start to come together. The orbital periods will start to de decrease. And this is just usually attributed to the emission of gravitational waves. The observation of the decrease in the period for this pulsar was the source of the Nobel Prize in physics in 1993, awarded to um, Russell Hulse here and Joe Taylor here. Uh, and you can see here the amazing, uh, the amazing uh, confirmation of, of general relativity's prediction of this. The blue line here is not a uh, best fit of the data. It's actually theoretical prediction by general relativity. Now, in more modern times, uh, and something you may be familiar with yourself uh, has been in the news recently, are methods for directly detecting gravitational waves on Earth. In this case, we can imagine a gravitational wave coming through in the, in the, in the line indicated through this device here this kind of two-arm interf interferometer modeled on the LIGO experiment. Uh, in that experiment, a laser uh, passes through, uh, a laser beam passes through a beam splitter. The laser beams travel a long distance across the two arms and then come back and re-interfere and you measure the re-interference pattern. You'll remember from the effects of gravitational waves that I mentioned before that they are going to progressively stretch one arm and shrink the other. As this stretching and shrinking takes place, it changes the interference pattern on the photo detector. And by measuring that interference pattern, we can reconstruct um, uh, features of the gravitational waves. Um, the pair of uh, interferometers in the LIGO experiment in Hanford, Washington, in Livingston, Louisiana, combined their signals um, back in um, the uh, in in 2016 to uh, come up with the first detection of a, a binary black hole merger that emitted a burst or chirp of gravitational waves. Uh, and this result, uh, which is uh, an enormous technical feat as where uh, as well as a theoretical one, uh, engendered uh, a number of special prizes uh, that year. 
OK, so we've got uh, lots of indirect and direct evidence for the existence of gravitational waves. And in all of these cases, there's a story about what gravitational waves are doing and how we measure their effect. So in the case of the particles, the Feynman sticky bead, thought experiment, and the LIGO detection, we've got a situation of the following. The apparatus moves, or it heats up, or it changes length when a gravitational wave passes through. There's an implicit premise that nothing moves or heats up or changes length unless energy has been imparted to it. And this is, uh, I think for many folks, pretty intuitive. To induce motion is to impart energy. To heat up is to impart energy. And the idea that uh, nothing is going to change length unless energy has been imparted to it. So gravitational waves carry energy, they carry energy from the source um, where they're admitted to the detector where they're detected. And there's a similar sort of argument for the shortening of the period in the holtz taylor pulsar. The idea there is that a pulsar and its companion in the binary system lose energy when its period shortness sh shortens, energy is conserved. So gravitational waves carry away energy. So this is the usual, these are the usual lessons. Uh, that are taken from these examples that gravitation provides a mean for the remote transmission of energy through purely gravitational degrees of freedom. The reason why I think that for philosophers, this has particular uh, importance has to do with this inference from energy to ontology that I mentioned before. Here's a very illustrative quote from Carlo Rovelli, even before these examples, uh, or obviously before the LIGO example that uh, took place. So Ravelli writes to us that a strong burst of gravitational waves could come from the sky and knock down the rock of Gibraltar, precisely as a strong burst of electromagnetic radiation could. Why is the first matter in the second space? Why should we regard the second burst as ontologically different from the second? Clearly, the distinction can now be seen as ill-founded. I, I want to draw your attention to this particular fact here, that Ravelli is making an ontological inference about gravitational fields as being of the same category of electromagnetic fields, because they have the same capacities to um, knock down the rock of Gibraltar, to affect change uh, in, 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 in matter, precisely as a strong burst of electromagnetic radiation could, does the gravitational waves um, induce its effect. Uh, the idea, of course, is that electromagnetic radiation does so by imparting energy and momentum to the rock if it were to knock it down. And the idea here then is that gravitational waves are inducing their effects in the same means. If we came to different conclusions about whether gravitational waves um, uh, induce their effects by the transference of energy and momentum, we, there might might come to different conclusions about the ontology of gravity. OK, so next I'm going to actually draw those different sorts of conclusions. So let's start with the different lessons from direct observation. These are the cases where the gravitational waves pass through objects in question, causing them to, or inducing in them, motion, heat, uh, or changes in shape. The first thing that's important about this is that um, in mathematical relativity, we can look at gravitational wave solutions to the Einstein field equation. And they tell us information about the energy content of gravitational waves. Here's the Einstein field equation. Here we have the energy momentum tensor that represents the local contributions of matter uh, in the presence of space-time structure um, to energy, momentum, angular momentum, and so on. This structure over here, which is sometimes abbreviated as the Einstein tensor, relates space-time geometry um, uh, in, in to, to this matter content. Here we have the Ricci tensor, the scalar curvature, the space-time metric, and lambda here is the cosmological constant. OK, so the significance of um, of this is that when we analyze gravitational wave solutions, uh, we find that they reside in a particular part of curvature, a particular part of curvature called the Weyl tensor. Uh, 
this complicated definition here for the vial tensor it may be not especially illuminating if you haven't studied general relativity. What's important though is that uh, the Riemann tensor here, which incorporates all of the effects of curvature, determines and is determined by a pair of other tensors, one, the Ricci tensor, and another, uh, the vial tensor. You'll see here that the Ricci tensor is the tensor that appears in the Einstein field equation. It's this component of curvature that is directly correlated with the presence of energy and momentum for matter, but not with the vial tensor. The um, laying down energy and momentum across space-time doesn't uh, immediately determine um, the structure of the vial tensor. In this sense, gravitational waves have certain sorts of degrees of freedom that are independent of matter. In particular, what's most important for our purposes, and it gets at the argument most directly, is that gravitational wave solutions, such as gravitational plane waves, are vacuum solutions. Vacuum solutions are solutions where TAB here, the energy momentum tensor, vanishes. It vanishes when there are no contributions or negligible contributions to energy and momentum at a space-time event from matter. Gravitational waves pass through regions uh, like this, and they do so even though in these regions, the Ricci tensor also has to vanish because they reside in the vial tensor here. If gravitational waves, of course, are passing through vacuum regions, um, then they're passing through regions that have uh, a vanishing energy and momentum. This energy and momentum is the energy and momentum that matter has. And so on the face of it, gravitational waves themselves have no energy and momentum associated with them. Now, one of the things that's significant about this is that uh, we can, in these particular cases, draw the mo more direct conclusion that the energy and momentum associated with gravitational waves is zero. Normally, in general relativity, we have a lot of trouble associating some sort of scalar quantity, like the amount of energy that's associated with a region. Let me explain a little bit about uh, what one tries to do in, uh, to ameliorate the situation. One of the things that we try to do uh, to formulate conservation conditions and associate uh, energy and momentum with regions is instead of assigning a particular um, quantity, what we do is we look at the flux of energy and momentum through a region. A flux is uh, uh, the difference between the outgoing uh, and the incoming. So in this particular case, we can imagine some observer or class of observers who are traveling through space-time. They're going to measure an, an, an energy momentum density that's given by this expression here. Mathematically, then, we can integrate this expression over a surface. Uh, this is a surface, a three surface in space-time. So it's really um, what we would no normally call um, uh, uh, a, uh, a volume, but in four-dimensional space-time, it appears as a surface. Uh, to find the energy momentum that is flowing in and flowing out according to that observer. If the balance is zero, that is some indication that we have a conservation condition. Now, one of the things, however, that, um, uh, that is going to be the case is that if uh, the energy momentum tensor in a region vanishes, if this is zero, then the quantity that this vector here, these as appearing as these little arrows are all going to be of zero magnitude. And if you integrate anything at zero magnitude over a region, you'll get zero. So as a consequence, every observer is going to agree that the energy momentum flux through a region that gravitational waves pass that's in a vacuum is going to have zero energy. And so it seems that we can come to a somewhat strong conclusion that the gravitational waves themselves carry no energy or momentum in the sense that appears in the Einstein field equation. So how do we explain the sources of motion and the sources of heat and the thought experiments that we talked about before? Well, for the oscillating test particles, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that whatever kinetic energy that they have is going to be coordinate dependent. That's to say that uh, if they have a velocity, um, that velocity depends on adopting a particular um, frame of reference. And what energy they have will differ depending on which frame of reference we select. And this is so despite the relative acceleration being independent.
of, uh, of coordinates. So the sense in which they have energy imparted to them is not a coordinate independent, um, uh, independent fact. Um, and the TAB, the energy momentum tensor that I was talking about, encodes just such coordinate independent facts about energy and momentum. As for the LIGO detector, its proper length changes kinematically without any local changes in energy, very much similar to how we have um, um, uh, effects about the changes uh, in length and special relativity. So this also happens uh, due to the natural motion of the different parts of um, the uh, detector, uh, just by following geodesics in space time without any changes in energy. What about the sticky beads? In the case of the sticky beads, the bar is doing work to reduce the beads relative acceleration. And that is the thing that heats it up rather than it being uh, imparted energy from the gravitation waves. You can think of this as a kind of adiabatic compression. Uh, remember in thermodynamics that there, um, we can uh, uh, describe a compression of a thermodynamical system such as an ideal gas that involves no changes in energy to it, yet involves a change in temperature. Like that case, we have here a situation where there is a change in thermodynamic state of um, the bar bead system that uh, locally is conserving energy. Um, but uh, the work that the bar does is the source of the change in temperature. Now, one of the things that we can draw from this that I think is an interesting and important conclusion is that gravitation and gravitational waves can facilitate real changes in the motion of things and can facilitate transformations in local thermodynamic quantities. And it can do so without the local addition or subtraction of energy. This is, I think, one of the novel conclusions that we learn, although there's a certain sense in which for this, all you really need is geodesic deviation. This is the natural tendency of objects to recede from one another or come together depending on space-time curvature in that region. It's not something which is specific to um, gravitational waves. We can see this if we imagine uh, a thought experiment where we have something like the sticky bead scenario. We have a bar with two beads on it that's now just falling naturally towards uh, a massive uh, object. So approximately the space time will be uh, Schwarzschild space time. These beads will feel um, uh, a geodesic deviation that will have their natural motion come together towards the center of the object. So you can imagine this is being pulled this way. If you want to think about a forceful analogy, like a Newtonian force analogy, and this is being pulled in this direction. And the result will be the natural motion of the beads to come together the bar will induce uh, uh, friction to impede their motion, and the work done will correspond with uh, a change um, in temperature. And this in particular can happen even in vacuum space times, um, as I've described it here, and it can also happen in informally flat space times. These are space times where the vial tensor vanishes, uh, and a good example of this is the standard model of cosmology. So these sorts of of effects where gravitation is inducing these sorts of changes are in fact not specific to gravitational waves. Uh, they're uh, generic to any sort of geodesic deviation, any sort of effect of gravitation that we have on any phenomenon. But there is something that makes gravitational waves special. Um, here, there is a certain sort of technical classification of space times called the Petrov classification that's useful. The gravitational waves that we've been talking about, transverse ones, are of a particular type that typically decay in magnitude, like one over the distance from a point source. The significance of this is, uh, is what makes, I think, gravitational waves special. It makes them longer range than comp comparable oscillatory gravitational effects that you might consider. What makes gravitational waves special, therefore, is not the sort of effect that they have, but the range with which they have it. Okay, let me recap the lessons on this first part, the lessons from the uh, direct observation of gravitational waves. First, gravitational waves don't carry the sort of energy and momentum that appear in the Einstein field equation. 
that's the sort of energy and momentum that matter fields exchange with one another to induce changes in one another. Second, gravitational waves facilitate changes in the motion or in thermodynamic states of matter, but so does any GD deviation. Gravitational waves are not unique in this respect. But gravitational waves are unique by their range with which they facilitate these transformations. And it's this range which I think experimental physicists are most excited because the range at which these changes are facilitated provides us information about distant phenomena in a way that we couldn't otherwise explore. It's not that the uh, phenomena are not, uh, don't leave their traces or leave their marks in other sorts of ways and other physical things. It's just that those, those sorts of uh, physical phenomena are so harder to detect uh, unless one is very close to the source. Gravitational waves really have their power um, with the range with which they induce uh, their changes. Okay, let's now go to the different lessons that I'd like to draw from indirect observation of gravitational waves. Remember, this is the case where we have the apparent decrease in orbital period of binary systems. How do we make sense of this binary in spiral? The usual story that people give is that the gravitational waves carry away energy from the binary system, and that loss of energy is the cause or the reason for why the binary system and spirals together. But we already know that this can't quite be the story. The same story applies to binary black hole systems. Indeed, the LIGO experiment um, um, detected such a, a binary black hole merger in its uh, famous uh, 2016 detection. But as you may well know, black hole space times are vacuum space times. They're vacuum space times because they don't have any um, contributions to energy and momentum around them. Or if there are any matter fields doing so, they're negligible with respect to the contributions of the black holes themselves. And so these objects can't be losing energy and momentum. They can't be losing any TAB, the energy and momentum that appears in the Einstein field equation, because they don't have any. But I do think that there's more to say. There's more to say than just that they don't lose energy. This is just what general relativity predicts. To do so, we can use another concept of energy that was developed in the 1950s and 60s. These are global concepts of energy that apply to special situations in general relativity. They apply to special situations because they apply to so-called isolated systems. Here's the idea behind that. In this diagram here, we have a kind of depiction of uh, an aspect of the curvature in the radial direction of a Schwarzschild space-time compared with a flat space-time. We can see that the curvature is rapidly increasing as we're approaching the origin here. An isolated system on this account is one where as one goes far and farther and farther away from the isolated system, the structure of the space-time approaches better and better and better that of flat Minkowski space-time. The, there are a lot of technical details about how this is supposed to work that I'm not gonna talk about at all. Suffice it to say though, that in these sorts of situations with these sorts of isolated systems, so-called asymptotically flat space-times, there's a way of associating for the whole space-time, that is to say the whole isolated system, a global four momentum and other sorts of conserved quantities. Because we're talking about gravitational energy, the four momentum is the most important part because the timelike component of the four momentum is going to be the global energy. So for this special type of situation, we can associate with an entire spacetime that represents an isolated system and energy. In fact, we can do more than that. Um, we can describe uh, at least two different global energies. One global energy is sometimes called the ADM energy. To do that, what we do is we look at a, uh, uh, such a uh, asymptotically flat system and we find two space-like slices through it. In this particular diagram here that I've taken from Roger Penrose, one of the folks who did the pioneering work in the 60s on making these ideas precise, we have uh, an isolated material source, such as a star, 
um, that's undergoing some evolution. Um, here we have one space like slice. Here we have another space like slice. What we can do is perform a particular calculation over these slices to calculate uh, the total energy contained uh, in between. And once we do, we find that it's conserved over time. So this is the idea that associated with this isolated system, there is an energy that stays the same. It's conserved. There is another notion, though, sometimes called the Bondi energy, that involves integrating over different surfaces. These two here, and these ones that are asymptotically null surfaces here are the ones that we integrate for, um, uh, for the Bondi uh, energy. The point in doing that is to sandwich between these two surfaces outgoing gravitational waves. And in doing so, we can calculate the effects that these outgoing gravitational waves have on the system. The result is actually, in fact, a decrease in the global energy of the system. The global energy at N1 will be in general higher than that of N2, and the difference will be given by flux of the gravitational waves to infinity, sometimes called the, the, uh, the Bondi Mu's function. What each of these notions is describing is effectively the far field behavior um, of the source. When you go very far away from the source, particularities to that particular source fall away and everything becomes roughly homogeneous that depends only on a few factors. How far away you are from the system, the system's effective mass and therefore it's its effective energy and features like that, like how much it's spinning. So by looking at the far field behavior, we can see effectively what sort of system it looks like. Does it look like a star with a particular mass and therefore a particular energy? or with a particular rotation. This is what these notions uh, describe. And so in a situation with gravitational radiation, what the Bondi energy describes is it describes the effective changes in these sorts of things in the far field region uh, due to outgoing waves. So we do have a way of making sense of what's going on and to capture our intuition for something is being emitted that is uh, affecting the changes in, um, in, this, uh, in these systems when they emit these gravitational waves. But the notions of energy here, I have to emphasize, are different from the ones that we considered in the previous section. Neither is fungible with the local notion of energy and momentum that contributes uh, to the quantity that appears in the Einstein field equation. These are both global notions of energy. This is a local notion. It's extremely tempting uh, on the story that I've given to say that because we find that the Bondi energy decreases with time, that gravitational radiation carries away positive energy from a radiating system. But I think we should resist getting carried away because strictly speaking, gravitational waves don't have any Bondi energy of their own. Remember that these global notions of energy are assigned to whole space times. Um, we can't divide the energy content into one part, which is associated with one part of a space time, and another, which is associated, say, the isolated system, and another with another part, the gravitational waves. Instead, it really applies only to a particular whole uh, asymptotically flat space time. So, gravitational waves don't have any Bondi energy uh, of their own. And we so, therefore, we can't say that the Bondi energy has excuse me, that the gravitational radiation, the gravitational waves have body energy that's carried away. All we can say is that the body energy decreases, but we can give a mechanism for how it does. Okay, so the second set of lessons um, that uh, we can draw from gravitational waves is that there are multiple non-fungible energy concepts in GR. They are involve uh, types of energy that are not exchangeable with some of them are local and some of them are global. All of them have an important theoretical role, but the theoretical role that they have are a little bit different. Uh, this is a, these are roles that these energy concepts more or less tend to share in Newtonian gravitation, but they come apart in general relativity. There's a lot more to be said about that, um, but let me continue on to the second lesson in the, in the last part of the talk. 
one of the things that I want to emphasize here is that some of these notions of energy that we've been talking about are conserved and some are not. We saw, for instance, that the bonding energy is in general not conserved when we have situations with gravitational radiation. But those that do not, the bonding energy, do change in a law like way. They don't change randomly or without explanation. We have a perfectly precise explanation for why they do and quantitatively for how they change. So there's nothing mysterious in this type of energy loss. Okay. Let's go on finally to a non-lesson, uh, a lesson that some have drawn from um, uh, these sorts of examples that I think is uh, a lesson that we ought not draw. This has to do with a general failure of energy conservation. Uh, you'd seen that just before I'd indicated that some notions of energy are not conserved in general relativity. This general lesson is that there isn't any general notion of energy conservation. So here are three folks uh, who've written influential work um, on this sort of topic in the last uh, couple of decades in philosophy of physics. Carl Huffer, writing in 2000, um, states that there's no general principle of energy momentum conservation to be found at all in general relativity. Uh, Vincent Lam, writing about a decade later, uh, stated that within the general theory of relativity, all meaningful notions of energy momentum, gravitational and non-gravitational, and mass, requires the introduction of some background structures. For him, the very notions uh, require the introduction of a structure that is foreign to general relativity, structure that you can add, but that is somehow uh, not a part of the theory itself. Patrick Dewar, writing about eight years later, most recently, uh, stated that energy conservation simply ceases to hold in general relativity. The gravitational wave detector, um, such as the uh, bar and bead system that we indicated, would just heat up without there being a causal story about it that would allow us to track the lost energy. I think that these conclusions about the uh, failure of um, uh, energy conservation in general relativity, as I've indicated, go a bit too far. So in this last part, I want to indicate why I think that's so. Let's first talk about um, different ways we might understand what it means for energy to be conserved. I talked a little bit before about the vanishing net, flu net flux condition. This is a situation where we contract the energy momentum tensor with the tangent vector for some field of observers. This produces a vector field that is the energy and momentum that that field of observers would uh, see uh, flowing through their uh, local events. So in this diagram here, once again, we have uh, these arrows indicate that vector field. These indicate the flow of energy, uh, energy and momentum as uh, as indicated by these observers. One thing that we might take as a condition for conservation of energy and momentum in the region is for these sorts of observers, if we enclose any particular sort of region, that the amount of energy and momentum flowing in is equal to the amount of energy and momentum flowing out. This is sometimes called uh, the vanishing net flux condition indicated here. Now, I do affirm that this is going to be sufficient for conservation, and it's going to be satisfied in a number of different ways. Uh, one way for it to be satisfied that we've already talked about is if energy and momentum tensor actually vanishes, then this, uh, um, then this flux uh, vector field uh, also vanishes, and so the integral must also vanish. Another situation is when the, uh, the vector field is a so-called time-like killing vector field. What this is, is a time-like symmetry of the space time. If you were to flow, transport, that is, all of the space-time structure located down here along this vector field, if it is a time-like killing vector field, then when you do transport it, the, um, the transported structure will equal the one at the point to which you transport it. This is the sense in which it's a kind of like, um, like a time-like symmetry of the space time. So if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a situation where the class of observers are 
uh, moving in space-time in this manner, in, in the manner described by um, such a time-like translation symmetry, then we'll also have this vanishing net flux condition. Another condition, which is the sort of condition that we have in the case of the uh, global notions of energy that I was talking about before, is when we have uh, fields that are, despite being uh, not killing vector fields, are asymptotically so. That is to say, they approach being a time-like killing vector field as you go off to infinity. And in these cases, the integral needs to be over an appropriate space-like slice. This is um, roughly speaking how the ADM energy we talked about before uh, is calculated. And indeed, in that case, the ADM energy is conserved. Now, what's important about all of these, uh, uh, these situations uh, is that these are all sufficient conditions for energy conservation. Um, I wanna emphasize that none of these conditions requires any sort of background structure to be introduced. Um, whether or not a particular vector field, right, is, um, is the killing vector field is something that's independent of the introduction of background structure. And it's sometimes mistakenly understood that the notion of asymptotic flatness is something that requires additional background structure. The initial formulation of asymptotic flatness in the 1950s did use extra background structure, but one of the seminal uh, pieces of work that Penrose and collaborators did in the 1960s was show that a, a version of asymptotic flatness requires no such background structure. Okay, so all of these in a certain sense are special cases. Um, they're all special cases because they're, they don't obtain in every single space time. This may make you wonder that whether or not energy conservation is itself a special case in, uh, in general relativity, that it's in conserved in some regions of some space times, but not in space, time, uh, sp space times in general. So you might think this, for instance, if you think that the vanishing net flux condition is not just sufficient for conservation, but also necessary. If you think that it's necessary, then the, if some of these conditions don't obtain and this integral is not zero, you might think that there is a net flux through this region, and that net flux indicates a failure of conservation. Um, however, I want to push back against this sort of idea. We find this sort of idea that I just indicated in some of Patrick Gura's recent writings. Even in a situation where it's pretty clear that we ought to have energy conservation, we can see that this um, that this integral can be non-zero for appropriately chosen um, classes of observers. Here's the example that I wanted to indicate to show that. The example involves a stationary perfect fluid in Minkowski space-time. So just imagine a completely flat space-time. There's a fluid uh, fl uh, flowing through it geodesically. Uh, it has constant um, energy density. So, uh, and it's got constant pressure. This is the energy momentum that's associated with it. It turns out that this energy momentum is not only uh, divergence free, that this quantity here vanishes. Uh, that's what is required actually by um, um, uh, the usual um, divergence free condition um, in general relativity, but it's covariantly constant. The differences between these two equations is uh, subtle, but uh, the main thing you'll see here is that this lower index here is not contracted on this equation. This condition here is stronger than the usual divergence-free condition. And this that this is true just follows from a straightforward calculation applied to this. The significance of this condition is that it means that the energy momentum tensor is in a literal sense unchanging. And if it's unchanging, uh, that's exactly the sort of situation that we could imagine is a situation where energy and momentum is conserved. But if we choose our class of observers as uh, observers who are experiencing uh, some net acceleration, then this flux integral is going to be non-zero, even in this sort of situation, even this sort of extremely simple paradigmatic situation of energy conservation. What that shows is that when we use the flux condition to determine whether or not energy or momentum is conserved, we have to be very careful about, about how we interpret and construct it. One of the things that's going to happen is that curvature mimics the effects of an accelerating uh, class of observers. 
So in these previous situations that I described before, um, where uh, these conditions here don't obtain and this integral uh, is non-zero, are situations in general where we're going to have uh, curvature in spacetime. But that curvature mimics the effects of um, a, an accelerating class of observers that give us misleading information about whether energy conservation is satisfied or not. What we have to do is we have to be a little bit more careful about interpreting this net flux condition. The net flux condition, uh, when it's applied to <clears throat> uh, some particular uh, three surface S, is only a sufficient condition for energy conservation. I think the divergence-free condition is in fact a sufficient and necessary condition, uh, condition for interpreting it as a kind of local conservation law. Let me give you an argument for why that's the case. So the thing that we want to distinguish are effects of acceleration and curvature from situations where we have real sources of new energy and momentum. The diagrams here are taken from uh, depictions of um, Gauss law type calculations in electromagnetism. You might remember these as situations where we calculate uh, the flux, uh, in this case, of an electric field through a surface. And if the surface uh, incorporates uh, within its interior uh, an electric charge, we get a, a non-zero value for uh, that integrated flux. So we can find sources of electric fields by finding sufficiently small regions that even if we shrink down on that region, we still have a positive uh, flux uh, through them. By contrast, we have no sources and conversely no sinks. This is where the field lines would go in. If for any of these regions, when we shrink down, we always find that the quantity is going to zero. And that's exactly what, we, what the divergence-free condition entails in general relativity. Here's how we show that. The first step is to point out that every space-time neighborhood has the same local approximate killing vector fields as Minkowski space-time. What I mean by that is that in a small region, we have a selection of vector fields that are approximate symmetries of that local region. And the way that they're approximate symmetries is the same way that they are of Minkowski space-time. These include time-like ones, uh, and hence we can uh, calculate um, uh, as a function of these, the integrals of um, energy and momentum flux. That'll give us a variety of different quantities, one for each uh, of these uh, uh, local approximate time-like killing vector fields. Then for any epsilon you give me, I can find a sufficiently small sub-neighborhood of the one that we started on, such that all of these integrals are less than epsilon in absolute value. That is to say, as we shrink these regions to any point, we find that it contains no sources or sinks. And that is the condition that we need in order to know that energy and momentum is conserved, that there are no sources or sinks for new energy and momentum flux as determined by any observer. So this is the justification for why this condition here really is a local conservation law contrary to uh, what some of um, our philosophical colleagues have concluded in the past decades. All right, so in this third part, I've drawn three more lessons about energy and momentum uh, that are in contrast to the lessons that some of my philosophical colleagues have drawn. One is that there's several useful notions of energy and momentum and their conservation, um, but contrary to what's sometimes said, they don't require background structures. I should say maybe here there are other notions of energy and momentum that do require these structures, but the ones that are relevant in the analysis of gravitational waves that I've just discussed uh, do not. Another is that there is only local vanishing net energy momentum flux, uh, or this condition is, is only necessary uh, for um, uh, that, excuse me, this condition of, of, of vanishing net energy momentum flux is necessary and sufficient for energy conservation. And this is equivalent, of course, to the divergence-free condition. And so therefore, local energy momentum conservation does hold in GR. We just have to be careful about how we justify it um, and uh, the conditions that describe it. Great.
thanks for your kind attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and for further discussion. So let's start with Jacob. Thanks so much, Antonio. And, and uh, Samuel, that was a, a great talk. I really appreciate it, very good. Um, so I'm a little bit confused about a couple of things. I'm hoping you can help clarify uh, some things for me. Mm -hmm. um, so my first instinct, which may be wrong, is when you started talking about TAB, the you know, energy momentum tensor that appears uh, on, on the source side of the Anson field equation. Um, when you started focusing on that, uh, I guess I was a little bit confused because the way I was trained, uh, I was trained to see that as the contribution to the uh, energy momentum coming from um, non-gravitational sources, not that it was the total energy momentum that should include gravity, so a lot of the arguments you were making were, were about TAB and gravitational waves move in a vacuum region where TAB is zero. Where is the energy momentum? Um, I guess I was a little bit confused because uh, you know, the way I learned the subject, uh, if you wanna keep, keep track of gravitational energy momentum, you have to, to look at the left-hand side of the Einstein field equation. Um, and you know these arguments go back many decades. I think in in uh, Carl's paper from two thousand, he refers to uh, the uh, gravitational energy momentum pseudo tensor, uh, and I think he, if I remember correctly, points back to um, you know Weinberg's textbook. Uh, there's a whole chapter in in Weinberg's book. I'm sure you're familiar with it's chapter seven on the Einstein field equation, and there's um, you know, detailed discussion about what you need to do if you want to talk about gravitational energy momentum. You need to basically extract out of the left-hand side of the Einstein field equation, the, the, the geometry side, uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, and that stuff constitutes this energy momentum pseudo tensor um, that, you know, in the, in the linearized limit looks a lot like the energy momentum tensor for the electromagnetic field. It's got derivatives acting on the, the gravitational field itself. Um, it's got some nonlinear corrections, which makes sense if you think of gravitational waves as uh, gravitational fields as sourcing their own, their own energy momentum. Um, and I guess I, I just didn't see that at all in the talk. And so I, I, I'm a little confused. If we're talking about where the energy yeah. is in the gravitational field and gravitational waves, it's, it's not going to be found in TAB. It's going to be found in these other terms. And I just, I, I was confused. I didn't see that in the talk. So help yeah. me out here. Yeah. So these, these other structures that you can define are the sorts of things that I think Vincent correctly in his 2011 paper correctly identifies as structures that require the addition of background structures to general relativity. Um, and although there's this long debate about what background structure is supposed to be, what background independence is supposed to be. I think essentially on every definition of them, these extra structures are extra background structure that's being added to the theory. So it's true. If you add extra structure, you can define in these other things. Um, I like to think about energy in terms of the role that it plays uh, in the fundamental parts of the theory, which in this case I take to be the Einstein field equation. So if we accept that there is a contribute that there is gravitational energy momentum, but that it doesn't show up right uh, in that particular tensor, it raises the question about whether or not it's the sorts of thing that unless you add extra structure to the theory is fungible with um, uh, the energy and momentum that we associate with matter. If it isn't, then it's not really clear that we can use gravitational energy and momentum to attribute the sorts of changes to matter that we would like to by arguing that they involve some sort of exchange of energy or momentum. And indeed, um, one of the things that distinguishes the spin two theory that Weinberg develops in his book and then others have talked about is that it requires an addition of background structure uh, in order to define what uh, the background Minkowski metric is and what the gravitational spin two field is on top of that. Um, so I think that you could give a different analysis 
the notion of gravitational energy. So it's entirely possible to give a different analysis of the nature of, of energy that gets associated with gravity or gravitational waves in a different theory than general relativity. It involves general relativity plus some extra stuff that you're postulating. So if you could, what is the extra structure we're talking about? I mean, what usually it's when gonna I- It's going to vary from case to case. So right. in, the, in the spin two theory, it's going to be a background and Kusky metric. Right, so this second, so this other metric field, right? It's not going to be the one that plays the gravitational role in the theories. Um, it should be mentioned; it's not always often acknowledged that, strictly speaking, this does require some um, restrictions of usual general relativity because mm -hmm. you can't have, you know, um, manifold topologies other than R four. Maybe there's some ways to get around this, but we don't need to go into the technical details for that. In the case of um, the most of the pseudo tensorial quantities, they involve um, well the old way of specifying them is through a particular preferred coordinate system. There's a more modern way of thinking about that in terms of complicated things involving um, pullbacks of constructions of frame fields. We don't need to go into the technical details about that either. But what these frame fields do, right, is they essentially determine a preferred coordinate system that allow you to define these extra things. And those extra frame fields um, are the extra structure in those particular cases. Um, there's a really nice review article in uh, Living Reviews of Relativity Theory by, um, I think, the Hungarian Sabados um, on notions of quasi-local energy. And one of the things that he's very good about is by detailing exactly how in all of these quasi-local notions, these are notions that get assigned to specific regions that I haven't even talked about in my, in my talk, really, all require the addition of some sort of background structure, uh, something that's in addition to uh, the metric, the matter fields, the Einstein field equation, um, and uh, in addition to perhaps also something like a temporal orientation. So that's the sort of sense in which I have these sorts of things require these background structures. And therefore, because we don't, if you take those background structures to be a part of your theory, I think that it, it does mean that you're looking at a theory which is different from general relativity. I think one of the things that's, that makes this very interesting though, is that it means that, mm, I think what the best interpretation of what's going on in the gravitational phenomena is very sensitive to these sorts of things. Um, but it ought to be because these sorts of things are postulations of extra space-time structure. And so our interpretation of space-time really ought to indeed depend on what space-time structure we postulate. I hope that was a little bit helpful. Yeah, so maybe I can, I can bring this down to a somewhat more concrete question. Uh, if I have a distribution of matter, a bunch of planets and stars in some compact region, uh, in an otherwise empty universe, which you know we often do to model all kinds of things, um, I don't. I mean, in practice, I can calculate, say, the Landau Lifshitz energy momentum pseudo tensor for general relativity. I can. Uh, it, it's not. It's not. Uh, uh, co you know, generally covariant, um, but I can uh, integrate it over space time and I can convert it into a surface integral uh, and I can calculate a total gravitational energy momentum of this system. Ah, and this- Yeah, so you're, you're thinking in particular the ADM? No, 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 this is no, not ADM. This is not ADM. So ADM is different, right? It, um, in, in, so one way to think about this, uh, 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 one way to think about this is, um, if you take the Einstein field equation and write it in trace reversed form, right? So you, you mm -hmm. just have R A B on one side, and then you have this combination of you know, two T A B minus trace, or you know whatever. Um, you can you can think of the you know total ADM mass energy of, of a region uh, as the integral of that modified right hand side, right? If you look at at what you're actually integrating, you're actually integrating this combination of two T A B minus G, you know, metric times trace of T. Um, 
you know, and then what's nice about that particular combination is it can be expressed as a total divergence. And so the integral over volume can be converted into a Gauss law type surface integral, but you're, you're really talking about matter energy momentum. If you do this for the short shell geometry, then what you get is the total M, right? If you, if you put a spherical body in the center of, you know, and you, you, yeah, but, you get M. I mean, I mean, I, I, I we have to be a little bit, a little bit careful, right? Because you know you can do this for a black hole as well, vacuum space right. time. You can exactly right? you do for a black hole, right? And, right. and you know, and there's no, so there's no ponderable matter here. This energy and momentum we're calculating, and this is why what the idiom construction is doing, right? Is this is why I explained it is by like looking at the far field behavior of the isolated system matching it with this parameter that we normally associate with isolated bodies that we have good reason to call mass and plays that role right. in Newtonian gravitation. Um, and I think that that's a perfectly fine usage of, of that, but it's distinct from these other concepts. Of right, but, but the integral I was talking about before where you account for the total gravitational energy momentum by taking the energy momentum pseudo tensor and converting it into a surface integral, that's a conceptually distinct uh, surface integral. It's it's different from the ADM mass. Uh, it, you're, you're integrating a different quantity. You're integrating different stuff. Yeah, I, you know. So I, I, I guess what, it's what really I'm, appropriate I'm to get into the technical. I, I know this is this is why I'm this is why I'm nervous. Of, yeah, I, I apologize. I, I, maybe we, we could maybe talk about this offline. But I guess what I'm just confused about is. I don't see where a background structure was invoked. We can just do these calculations if you have. Oh, a compact... I mean, the background structure is invoked in order to find the pseudo tensor. Well, right, because you need a, a, a solution to the Einstein field equation that's asymptotically flat. Ah, but this. this is the key thing: asymptotic flatness does not require background structure. This is one of the things that is Penrose's big innovation in the 1960s over Bondi. Um, Bondi was great but the construction was not obviously background independent. And one of the things that Penrose showed is how to do it in a background independent way. Okay. I mean, my, my, my worry is just that if one basically throws all that out and says it, it depends on extra structure, we can't do it for pure general relativity. I guess where I'm confused is why we can then go back to TAB and try to find everything we want there. I mean, look, let me put it another way. If we had all this extra structure, it would be clear that the gravitational energy was in this other stuff, these other mathematical devices. If we're not willing to have that extra structure and we throw it out, why should we expect to be able to find all this gravitational energy momentum in the non-gravitational sector, the, the matter sector? I mean, after all, TAB doesn't have any, there's no derivatives of, of the metric in TAB, it, it doesn't seem to do to have things in it that look like gravitational energy. But okay, I'm just I'm 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 still a little bit a little bit confused. But this is probably just me. We'll we'll come back to it if there's time. Okay, how about that? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll hold off. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Carl. Good. So. Um... I really enjoyed the talk also, Sam, and, uh, and I, I liked a lot of it, uh, right up to the point where you started saying I was wrong. But uh, <laughs> um, actually, some of the things that you pointed out with the nice uh, discussion of the Feynman beads and, and other stuff in the early part of the talk, I would have gladly put it into my paper as more grist for my mill had, had I had it available, because I was really more concerned with um, undercutting belief in the reality of uh, gravitational wave energy or just gravitational energy in general, mm -hmm. rather than uh, attacking energy conservation per se, although I thought it was right. a consequence that follows. And I'm, I'm, I'm still a little um, un, unmoved by the, the considerations you raised at the end when you were defending that we have a perfectly good, um, albeit local notion of conservation yeah. for, for regular TAB because it's, um, I mean, I think that the attitude I was taking, and maybe also Vincent and others, is that if it's um, if it can't be expressed um, as an integral 
conservation law over a, a you know a, a non vanishingly small volume it's not real um, conservation and all the examples that you gave where there it seems like they no this is real conservation but you introduce a killing field or you introduce um, a field of dust in Minkowski space time all these things feel like just you know yeah you can bring in a special case and then make a very strong argument that that we we see clearly the TAB is being conserved but it, uh, I'm on Jacob's side here, it doesn't feel like that's right. generally applicable. Right. I think there's two things to say. So one is that um, I, I only take our, our disagreement to be on the narrow issue about conservation. Um, I think when it comes to gravitational energy, Carl, actually you and I agree completely about that matter. Um, uh, the um, the the matter, so maybe I can uh, I think I probably went through my argument at the end too quickly. So the structure of the argument is supposed to be that the following, everyone it seems has assumed that um, vanishing of these uh, flux integrals um, is necessary and sufficient for conservation. And what I'm trying to argue is that it's sufficient, but that it's not necessary. And the way that I did this by is by giving an example where for other reasons, we have manifest reason to believe that there's energy conservation. That was the dust, the dust example, uh, the fluid example, but where by judicious choice of class of observers, we can get this flux integral to be non-zero. So how do we diagnose what's going wrong in that example where it's manifestly, and you know, it's a situation where nothing is happening. There's just some fluid. There's no vibrations or anything. And this is supposed to be emphasized by the fact that the energy momentum for that, um, uh, for that solution is not only divergence-free, but covariantly constant. So what's going wrong with the example? Uh, the idea is what's going wrong with the example is that when we pick a class of observers that uh, is uh, not well adapted to the geometry. We can get a situation where what appears to be a violation of flux having to do that's related to the acceleration of the observers. My suggestion is that what's going on in the general relativistic case is that space-time curvature is doing the same sort of thing. Space-time curvature is doing the same sort of thing that acceleration does. Right, right. That, that, let me ask a clarificatory question, if it's all right, yeah. Antonio, here, because um, here, I think I did sort of get the point when you were making the, the talk, but I was worried about uh, a quantifier <laughs> question. Like, I, I thought that the idea of the sufficiency was that if you can find um, um, a vector field, i.e. set of observers, where we get this kind of uh, um, concert, this kind of um, flux condition holding over a finite volume, then that's sufficient. But but it, it, it's sort of a, there exists at least one kind of claim. And then um, it's not meant to be uh, a for all. So it's not for all uh, vector fields. And then right. when you bring in your dust field and talk about how we can pick, we can find um, a vector field or observer uh, field where we get a, a similar failure, even though we know there's conservation. My, my, why isn't the right answer to that to be, so what? We never said that that um, it had to work for every. Um... Yeah, that, that part wasn't intended as a reductio of that first part. The, the second part was rather supposed to get us to start thinking about why we only select certain vector fields. Why only certain ones? Why not all of them? Why should certain observers be special and others not count? It's a puzzle, or at least prima facie, it's a puzzle. And this part of the argument is supposed to show that the reason why is that in cases where it's manifestly clear that energy is conserved, certain sorts of, you, you, there's different ways of phrasing this. You can talk about it in terms of acceleration. If you like the Einstein equivalence principle, you can talk about it in terms of like, like uh, transformations between presence of gravitation and acceleration. If you like to think about it in terms of inertial frames, you can think about it in terms of like it being a non-inertial effect. Um, no matter how you do it, once we identify what's going on wrong in those cases, 
we see that, or the suggestion is that what's going wrong in those cases where we have these bad observers is exactly the phenomena that curvature is generating. So it's not a, so it's not a reductio, it is a kind of uh, IBE uh, argument. Um, I'm, I'm trying to suggest that what is happening to uh, the, in the gravit, in the curvature case is exactly the sort of case where we've diagnosed what's gone, why we can't select any sort of class of observers. And once we've identified that, we can then uh, realize that, uh, that maybe there's some other way that we can try to capture what's going on when we're trying to talk about energy conservation. And the suggestion is that um, what, the, what the net, uh, what, the, what the zero net flux condition is trying to do, or one, what, what it captures is that there's no like sources or sinks for energy and momentum in the region. If that's the case, then we can use this other condition that I'm proposing. And this other condition that I'm proposing is necessary and sufficient for there being no sources or sinks in this sense. And this other condition is equivalent to the energy momentum tensor being divergence free. Uh, yeah, locally though. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay, absolutely. I, I have more to ask, but um, maybe uh, you can put me back at the end of the queue, Antonio, if, if there's time. Sure, thanks. Uh, Brian. Oh, you got to unmute, Brian. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, much of what I would have wanted to ask has been said by uh, Jacob and Carl already in terms of what one might have thought gravitational energy would be and what one might have meant by conservation. Uh, but uh, I, I, I want to ask about a package that many people consider sort of generally satisfactory. So you have a Lagrangian density and there are some symmetries of the laws. And then you have uh, Noether's first theorem and you turn the handle and get a continuity equation. And then you can integrate that and get some sort of total stuff equals constant rule. That's kind of, you know, that, that, that's you know, I think pretty widely regarded as satisfactory at least for other theories. And formally all of that technology applies in general relativity. Um, is your advice that we should uh, not think about those things because they involve illicit appeal to extra stuff, or should we use second derivatives and get maybe like a, a Comar pseudo tensor that's, uh, that uh, doesn't remind you of the Einstein or Landau Lipschitz, and so it's all trivial or old news? Or, uh, you know, how do you deal with sort of default package that doesn't seem to play any role in, in your story? Yeah, I think the default package is another route for getting at the same sort of thing if one is sufficiently careful about what sort of, if you don't mind the metaphor, wrapping paper you use. So I think the issue is that in the, in the kind of default story, it can be very easy to add in extra stuff into your wrapping paper in your ribbon um, that uh, maybe you didn't, in, you didn't really intend. But if one is careful enough, then I think that the story that you get um, uh, the story that you, the story that you get ends up being that you get the usual sort of, um, local conservation laws. Um, what I mean is the, the divergence tree of the energy momentum tensor. And in the global case, uh, if I recall correctly, there is literature about how you can understand. Yes, actually I'm, I'm confident about this now. So you can understand ADM and Bondi conserve quantities in terms of this sort of machinery where the relevant structure, right, are vector fields on the conformal boundary uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, asymptotically flat space time. And this is where things like the BMS group and super translations and all that stuff plays a role if you want to go down that route. Um, I decided, I thought about doing that in the talk, but then I decided that the way that I presented it would have been a more straightforward. Uh, as as you well know, Brian, like the technical stuff with that can like be a little fidgety, uh, and I thought it would be a more straightforward route to talk about these sorts of ideas in the way that I did, rather than going through that route. 
so I hope that's that's all to say that I, I don't see sense any 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 conflict ultimately if we're careful about our choice of wrapping paper and ribbons. So so uh, maybe, maybe I should say the further question. Can I ask about what do you take the background structures to be? Like are coordinate systems background structures in this context, even though they seem to be part of the manifold or uh, so it depends. Like the Einstein pseudo tensor. Uh, and it's got some vices, but or pick any pseudo tensor just for that. Uh, it, it, it makes sense relative to a coordinate system. Famously, knowing it in one coordinate system gives you relatively little idea what it is in another one. And for many people, that's a fatal vice. Uh, but I mean, is but uh, you know, co coordinate systems seem to be part of the story as soon as we have a manifold. Oh, so the issue has to do with not that there is a coordinate system involved, but rather not, rather if you want the thing to be well-defined, you want it to be invariant under the isomorphisms of the category of mathematical structures that you're using. And if it's, this is, I mean, this is, it's a basic part, I guess I'm just taking on the standard story for definability theory here. Uh, we, we could go into like, like technical detail about that, which I'm really into, but we don't need to in this case. I would just point you again, you know, if I could, to the uh, Living Reviews article by Sabados on quasi-local notions of energy. He has really good references on how these sorts of things, and you probably already know this. I mean, apologies, Brian, if you do. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a good article. I probably like different parts of it from you, though. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But my understanding is that for these pseudo-tensor things, you can, you can understand them in the way that I would consider to be um, mathematically kosher if you understand them as involving certain sorts of constructions where you, you pull back certain types of frame fields and constructions uh, involving those uh, in, in certain sorts of ways. There is a, a way to make all of these things uh, well-defined by my lights. Um, and, but the way that they do this is by adding extra, extra, extra structure. So a preferred coordinate system would be analogous to like a preferred frame field or something like that. And so the sense in which it is extra is that um, general relativity doesn't come with any preferred frame fields. You can add them if you want to, uh, but then you have a, a theory with different space time structures, the idea. Right, so also it all depends on what you consider about the fine. Thank you. I put a link, I think, to the paper. Sam, is that the paper that you're referring to? This is the Sabados paper. Perfect. Yeah, that's it. Okay. In case it's helpful. It's 163 pages. Definitely a good week of reading. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't recommend uh, it to be beach reading, but uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sebastian. Uh, yeah, thanks, Antonio. And thanks, Sam, for the talk. Um, as you said the other day when we were talking, yeah, this you gave me a good anticipation of what was going to happen. And um, yeah, um, I like it. I thought it was clear. I, I have, a, I guess, one and a half questions, depending on what happens with the answer to the first question. And okay. it has to do with the bits. So let's go back, I guess, to the bits, because there's something that's confusing me a little bit about that. So you say, like, similar. Like, you might be tempted originally to say the gravitational wave, in some sort, it's, trans it's transferring energy to the bits, and the heat that you get when the bits start oscillating due to the friction, in some way, that energy, this is the naive story, this energy might be coming from the gravitational wave, and you want to push against that idea, um, and say, well, no, this is more, you should think of the bits more like it is transitioning from one thermodynamical state to a different one. And in some way, the way facilitates the transition, but the, but the, the wave is not giving like, it's not accounting or is not the source of the apparent change in energy of the system. Yes, thermodynamically, right? there's no heat transfer. Yes. And so you say it's similar to an adiabatic process uh, in, in standard thermodynamics. But I guess what I got confused is, um, well, originally the bits, if you were to measure the, like 
there's no heat transfer of anything. Like suppose you encircle the system, you put it in a box or something, right? In a container. And uh, originally the container has uh, is not detecting any energy. And then after the wave passes, due to the friction, the thing is gonna pick up some energy coming from the heat, right? So it's a weird transition because normally, like I mean, my point is like the analogy kind of confuses me, or the yeah, the, the so, idea that this, yeah, what's going on here, right? So you know, um, uh, so if you you know uh, if you think about just the case of, a, of an ideal gas, just for simplicity, you can have an, an adiabatic compression of the gas. So there's no heat being transferred between the gas uh, yeah. and any external system. The gas compresses and it heats up. Yes, right. but there so, is work in that case, right? Yes, and indeed. Uh, well, so and in, in, in the particular case that I'm describing, the bar is doing work against the beads, right? I see, but what is the source of the, I, I, I see, but what is the, an, an, like in the gas case, there is an external system exerting a force. So what if you take the bits and the rod or the bar as the system, like all of that together, like the rod, the rod and the bits as one, like as kind of system. And then, then it would be weird because it would be like an internal work. It shouldn't be producing heat, right? Well, the bar itself is also going to undergo, uh, is also going to do work to resist the natural motion, the natural geodesic motion. So remember, picturesquely, you've got the, the different parts of the bar, which are falling mm -hmm. towards the center of the planet. And so there's some geodesic deviation there. And the bar has to exert work in order to resist that compression, right? So the bar, it's the whole system itself is exerting, exerting work. What I do think is novel here uh, about general relativity is that it's facilitating these thermodynamical transformations in a non-material way. So we're used to the idea of adiabatic compressions where we have uh, material contact between two thermodynamical systems. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting about general relativity, and this is the novel things that we learn, that's not specific to gravitational waves, but to gravitation in general, is that it facilitates these sorts of transformations without material contact. I see. Okay, cool. So yeah, I think that clarifies the first part of my question. So suppose now that we go with that story, right? Um, but then suppose that someone else goes with kind of Brian or uh, Jacob's story where they want to introduce or think of this pseudo tensors or like this other route where you get like uh, laws that are uh, like local laws but that involves pseudo tensors of some sort, right? You would say, I mean, this is kind of what I'm just trying to understand is that dialectic here. So if you give your story, okay, you can write that story for why the heat in the bar is produced. Mm -hmm. But then if the other people go through the other route and say, well, let's, let's appeal to these other uh, local laws that uh, involve pseudo tensors, maybe justified by another theorem or whatnot. Then in that case, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that there you could actually say that the heat appearing in the road is actually due to gravitational energy or something like gravitational energy or a quantity similar to gravitational energy. Um, and so you have two very different explanations for apparently the same phenomena. I mean, I, I'm not, is that you think a fair assessment of what would happen or you would say, no, the other story still is wrong in their own terms or something like that. Uh, so I, I think the story on the other, on the other way of telling it, um, wouldn't change the story that I gave about this being analogous to an adiabatic process. What I think would change is that you would consider you could have an argument that 
instead of facilitating adiabatic transformations without uh, mechanical contact, you could give an argument that what is being going on is that there is a sort of mechanical contact insofar as there is a change in the pseudo tensorial energy of the uh, gravitational wave um, yeah. and, and a corresponding change in the bar due to these um, stress or compression uh, effects. I would say that maybe this situation is even more of a contrast in the other cases. So like take the, the, the particles that get have their induced motion. In that case, you say, or you could have an analogous case where uh, the you know the particles are connected by a spring, and so they 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 start doing uh, an, an oscillation, uh, and you can measure that with uh, spring compression and things like that. Assuming that the spring is uh, uh, lossless, right? Then it'll be like the um, test particle case if the spring is a, a real spring. Right, and it has uh, and it has losses. Then it's going to be more like the sticky bead example. In these cases, according to this frame-dependent notion of energy, these things really have energy now, right? Because in a particular frame, they weren't moving. Now they are moving. We just calculate the kinetic energy, and it's 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 that simple. Um, and you can calculate that you know the energy you know that gets transferred. It has a direct correlate in the amplitude of the gravitational waves. Um, okay. um, so on my story, though, right? There's that notion of energy is, you know, frame frame specific. If you picked a different frame, you would get a different answer for what the story is. This is part of the reason why I think that there is, unless you have a different space time theory where you do have a preferred frame. The story, these sorts of explanations do have certain defective aspects to them. Because if you pick a different frame, which is, you know, you get a different story for what happened, you get a different explanation. And you get this conflict between these different explanations then that seem like they're conflicting with one another. I think the answer to resolve that is that these involve structures that are not a part of space time structures that are not a part of the theory. This is why I think the better explanation is the one that doesn't involve this extra structure. Good. I mean, I was happy with everything except at the very last thing because in classical wow. mechanics, you also have kinetic energy that yeah. is frame dependent, right? You but do. it's perfectly fine to say, yes, kinetic energy is a good property, but it has frame dependent. Or do you have a problem with that in classical mechanics? Well, it really depends on whether you're doing classical mechanics in Newtonian space time or Galilean space time. So if you're doing it in Newtonian space time, then there is an objective notion of kinetic energy that is not frame dependent. If you were doing things in Galilean space time, then what kinetic energy something has is going to be frame dependent. But we we can lift, right? We can we can abstract away from that sort of stuff and think about things in a four-dimensional way. We can have four vectors of energy and momentum in those frameworks. Um, and on that story, like I think things uh, simplify, uh, simplify, uh, simplify greatly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you. If if I may have a, a very quick uh, follow up, is is more on the metaphysical side of, of the Please. discussion. Um, uh, you mentioned Carlo Rovelli and uh, his uh, attitude towards uh, gravitational waves to see them as uh, the effects of yet another, let's say, field uh, like the electromagnetic one. And so I think that Brian would call uh, uh, Rovelli an uh, egalitarian with respect to, to uh, the, the field. Now, uh, I am more of an, an exceptionalist. So I will say that perhaps uh, some of the problems that uh, these guys have and then are prone to um, objections like uh, Patrick Dur's one is that they want to force uh, too much a picture of the, uh, of the determination relation between uh, uh, the wave and uh, the, the motion induced in the material system, which is causal. It is very markedly relying on this notion of uh, energy transfer. But uh, perhaps 
we may weaken this kind of picture because we think that it is a bit at odds with, uh, uh, with general relativity. And we can say that the de determination relation at uh, uh, work here is not causal in this straightforward sense, but it's something perhaps uh, halfway between uh, causation and grounding, uh, stuff like that, so that there may be particular cases in which the analysis of what's going on uh, can be cast in causal terms, and that's okay, but this is not always the case uh, in, in, in general relativistic uh, systems. So I was wondering, what is your view regarding this sort of determination relation at work, uh, for example, in the case of the sticky beads? Yeah. Um, good. So um, I I agree with. I'm hesitating because I'm trying to remember the details of your paper on this, which I read a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I, um, well, here's one way of putting it. Um, I can remain agnostic as to whether or not, what, how, how we should understand metaphysically what ex sort of determination or dependence relations these are. Maybe it's some, as you suggest, you know, hybrid of causation and grounding or some, some other category entirely. Um, the, but I do think that um, whether or not it requires, whether or not that's a part of um, uh, Ravelli's argument, uh, I would have to ask him because he's not, when he talks about, or at least in the, the portion that I described, um, the argument is not explicitly that like gravitation induces, is a cause of things, therefore it has to have the same status. It's more like gravitation intervenes on things. No, no, that's not the way that he phrases it. Uh, gravitation has the same sorts of effects as material things and has them in the same way. And so they ought to have the same ontological status. And so independently of whether you think those effects are causal effects or some other type of effect, um, uh, it's not the case that, on my view, gravitation and matter do it in the same way. Um, and so that is, I think, totally compatible with your own view that the sort of dependence relations it, involved here are non-causal, but between matter, they may be causal. Does that speak to your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw Van San, uh, but now he, he disappeared. Van San, do you want oh, to no. ask your question yes. very quickly? Can, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. I, I'm sorry, I'm traveling, so my connection is very bad. I'm sorry. Very quick question. Thank you very much for the talk. Very quick question. Would you agree with the general claim that given a, a compact finite space-time region, uh, there is no unambiguous way to define the the content of energy matter in this in this region. In this, um, uh, if if by the content you mean like a, a scalar quantity that you assign to it, I would yes. agree with you that there is not in general, except in some special cases. Um, but yeah. I would say that the special cases. Um, don't the special cases don't necessarily involve extra background structure. Is what I would say. Okay, thanks. And and how do you position yourself with respect to the difficulties that the the black hole people had to define some local quantities with to respect to to black holes? I mean, they, they've been working on this uh, for a long time and being very disappointed. And so, what's what's the sign? It's what, what does it mean according to to you? Oh yeah, so I, I think you know we're on the same page about that, Vincent. So we've been talking about this um, living reviews and relativity paper by uh, Sapados, which is uh, very nice. It goes into all of the extra background structures you need in order to define quasi-local uh, energy quantities. And I agree with Sapados, and I think with you on the matter that if you wanted to define in the general cases um, energy for those types of regions, you do need background structures. The sorts of situations that I had in mind were the sorts of special cases that I was mentioning where, for instance, if the energy momentum tensor vanishes in a region, you can, I think, 
coherently say that the energy content of that region is zero. Okay, thanks, Sam. Thank you. Uh, so let's go back to Jacob and then Carl. Thanks so much. Uh, this conversation has been very clarifying. Uh, thank you, everybody, and also Samuel for for uh, your answers. Very clarifying. Um, so I had a quick look at, at the Sabatos paper in the relevant sections, and this this also clarified. I think I was trying to understand what was what, what precisely you'd meant by background structure, what he meant by background structure. Um, so you know, the basic issue, right, is if you forget about um, you know relativity, you go back to the old Newtonian world. Um, you know, if you choose a, a non-inertial reference frame, you're going to see phenomena that appear to violate energy conservation all over the place. And the lesson here is don't use a frame like that. Uh, use no, very inertial good. reference That's frame. That's the kind of argument that I Exactly. Thinking. Right. This is, this is why your, your answers were very clarifying. You also, when you were discussing the, the um, uh, perfect fluid example, this, you, you're talking about acceleration, curvature playing a role in similar acceleration. This was very clarifying. So in, in that picture, you know what you do is you, you if you want to use energy conservation you, you just need to pick uh an inertial reference frame which in in the in in you know the the gr version of the story means picking a a good uh four velocity right which which would correspond to uh mm -hmm. um a uh, uh you know a, a being in an inertial frame of course the problem in in general relativity is that uh well, it's not clear what frame to pick anymore, because if you're in a curving space time, there's no global inertial reference frame anymore. Um, the only sort of canonical local frames that are sort of singled out are the local inertial frames, and in the local inertial frames, gravity disappears in that location where, where you are. Um, oh, that's a controversial thing. Well, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I mean this operationally. Okay, so, mm. um, well, okay, obviously, if you have non zero curvature, they're going to be, you know, you're going to see geodesic deviation and, and so indeed, forth. But indeed. Exactly. But what I mean is, if you attempt to define, uh, you know, an energy momentum tensor for the gravitational field at a point, you know, in, in typical physical systems, energy and momentum are quadratic and first derivatives of whatever the degrees of freedom are. They are for Newtonian energy, kinetic energy, they are for electromagnetism. And of course, the problem is that first derivatives of the metric, you can make them vanish at any point by choosing local inertial reference frame. So if you attempt to write down a, you know, generally covariant energy momentum for gravity, you're going to find at every point it's got to be zero, because you can always pick a local inertial frame in which the first derivatives of the metric vanish. Hmm. And if a tensor vanishes at a point in, in any uh, uh, coordinate system, it by general covariance, it vanishes in all coordinate systems. So we have a basic conundrum here. Like, what do, what do we do? Um, now, there are, of course, other notions of energy momentum in general relativity. TAB is another notion of energy momentum. Uh, and then, of course, there's this other combination that appears on the right hand side of the trace reverse Einstein equation. This is the thing that gets integrated to give you the ADM mass. And, and these are usually regarded as, as you know, matter generating gravitational fields, right? Because mass energy is playing two roles. It's playing its kinematical role. It's also playing its role in generating gravitational fields in general relativity. We, we, we have these sort of distinct notions of energy momentum that we have to think about. What um, do you take to be a gravitational field, Jacob? Okay, it's a, a very good question. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the, re the reason why I'm saying this is that... Um... I, I, I would say, I would say that, that my my definition of a gravitational field is uh, is is anything that produces geodesic deviation is non-zero curvature. If you have uh, globally flat or a region of of, of flat spacetime, uh, that's an operational definition of the gravitational field is 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 is, is zero in that in that region. But um, you know, that's, that's a sort of generally covariant definition of, of no gravitational field. If you're talking about individual observers, you know, looking at things from an inertial, local inertial reference frame, there's an apparent disappearance of the gravitational field, you know, at, at a point. Oh, I, I, so the, the reason why I'm, I'm going through this is that, yeah. as I mentioned extremely briefly at the beginning of the talk, this is part of a bigger project on foundations of general relativity in which I am propounding 
a particular interpret general interpretation of the theory. And one of the aspects of the interpretation of the theory is that, um, uh, like, I don't, I don't think we should think of the gravitational field insofar as we can as a material field. Um, and that it's better to speak of kind of like gravitational phenomena, gravitational effects, yeah. because talking about a gravitational field very strongly suggests that it's, you know, uh, on a par with, with uh, material fields. Right. Um, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this other viewpoint, like the one that Ravelli uh, talked about, is somehow internally con inconsistent. But I do think there's a lot of interpretive problems with it. Um, yeah. So I actually had a question. In, it, yeah. I actually had a question that I, that I wanted to ask about this. I, I apologize, okay. but, but this, this may clarify where I was headed. Just sure. You know. um, so we have different notions of energy momentum. We have energy momentum of matter that's, that sources whatever. It appears on the right-hand side of the, of the Einstein field equation. Um, and then there's this question about, uh, you know, potentially is there gravitational energy momentum? Um, we certainly would like the part, the, the, the notion of energy momentum that, that sources gravitational fields, again, you know, with whatever, you know, yeah. concerns one has over talking gravitational fields, but, but in a flat footed picture of the Einstein field equation, you got TAB and it somehow is, the thing responsible for the gravitational fields. If you have an ADM mass, if you have a spherical body with some ADM mass, whether it's a planet or a black hole, whatever, right? There's 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 some non-zero ADM mass that you calculate, and it corresponds to some particular geometry. Uh, and we'd certainly like that to be a non-gauge dependent thing. It would be very weird if something that was doing this very concrete thing, making a particular space-time geometry that causes planets to go around at a particular like. If the thing producing it were gauge dependent, that would be weird. And in fact, one of the arguments that people often make for um, the reality of an absolute notion of, of energy, right? When people are, are, are talking about, um, you know, when you, when you take a course in quantum field theory, they're like, oh, without gravity, we can always reset the zero of quantum, you know, you add up all the zero point energies, you get some huge number, maybe infinite, but it doesn't matter. With no gravity, you can just reset the zero of your, uh, energy density and pretend it's not there. But in general relativity, you can't do this. There is some absolute notion of how much energy momentum is there because of this, this effect of this gravitational field. But that notion of energy being discussed is TAB type energy momentum. Yep. There is also gravitational energy momentum that you could talk about. And what the Sabato's paper seems to be saying, if I'm reading it correctly, and what, what you seem to be saying is that if we want to give a um, non-gauge dependent fundamental physical ontological meaning to gravitational uh, energy momentum, then we need some background structure added to general relativity. We need to pick out a particular metric. And I agree with this statement. However, if you're willing to say that gravitational energy momentum, which plays a different role from ADM type or, or gravitational TAB type energy momentum. If you're willing to say that gravitational energy momentum is gauge dependent, then you don't need a background structure, right? You just, you just say, well, we pick a gauge. Within that gauge, we calculate what the yeah, energy momentum pseudo tensor is, and then we can use it to solve problems. We can use it to analyze beads, sticky beads moving on rods, as long as we acknowledge that this is a somewhat gauge dependent notion of energy. Yeah, I, I just think it, it amounts to the same thing, right? That gauge dependence amounts to uh, being relative to a particular, the significance or the meaning of the quantities calculated are relative to some choice of background structure. So this is where I disagree. I, I, I fundamentally disagree. I think that uh, we do all kinds of things where we pick convenient gauges to solve problems, to understand what's going on in physical systems. Sure. But we're not committing ourselves to any one gauge as being the true gauge. We acknowledge that the quantities we're calculating are not, are gauge dependent, you know, but mm -hmm. the role that, that gravitational energy is playing in this, in these calculations is, is, is a, a, an operational role. You want to understand why the beads move the way they do. You pick a gauge in which you can use this notion of gravitational energy. You can yeah. use calculate the motion of the beads and you say, look, I'm, I'm using gravitational energy to solve a problem. 
I don't think there's actually all that much disagreement between us. Yeah, because, I think so. Yeah, uh, because um, in the situations you're describing, when there's some particular calculation that someone wants to undertake, um, oftentimes there's there is some extra structure you can appeal to. You don't want to have necessarily some notion of energy, say, which uh, is independent of uh, any particular um, a, a quantity which is described independently of any particular measuring apparatus because you intend to measure it with that apparatus over there, right? And so you use, for instance, a, you know, a, a frame that is co-moving with that apparatus or some other things like that because you want to be able to tell, I'm, you know, I'm more of a theorist, right? But like tell your experimentalist friends, like this is the thing you should be expecting when you do this sort of measurement. But what happens is of course that in order to do this, we need to make reference to this extra thing in this experimental apparatus that selects out that structure. Right. So in that particular case, I wouldn't say that the experimental apparatus is background structure. I would say it's material. And what we are doing is we're adapting particular calculations to the interactions between some particular material situation situated in space and time and this gravitational phenomena. I think that as long as we're clear on that, then I think that there's there's no disagreement. Either. Yeah, I think there's no disagreement. My, my point of view, I guess, coming out of this is I'm, I think it's okay to say that gravitational energy momentum is a gauge dependent, useful tool for studying systems. Um, and as long as one doesn't read too much into it or take it too seriously as fundamental and, and non-gauge dependent, it's available. It's available as a tool to yeah. understand what systems are doing. Yeah, I think there's no there's no disagreement here. All right. This was very, this is why I told you I was just confused. This is incredibly wonderful. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, Kai. So if I could just come back to um, your argument in favor of the, the local conservation of TAB. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess. Um, Thinking back to the perspective I had when I was writing my paper, I would I probably would have said something like, "Well, the the sense in which I think that um, ordinary matter, as we encode it in T, is is not really conserved, is the kind of is a phenomenon that just literally can't show up on, uh, at a point. It, it takes a region of space and time to show up, and so I wouldn't be moved by the fact that you could say, look, I make the, I make conservation appear when I if you let me go as small as I like down to a smaller region is like, I, I agree that that's the case mathematically, but it doesn't feel like the, the, um, that matters very much since we're interested in whether T in the bulk, TAB is really conserved. How do you distinguish when you're doing that situations where you have an apparent failure of conservation because of the sort of things that I was telling you about, where you have a class of observers who are accelerating, or so I've argued, analogous effects that that um, curvature generates. I, I, you know, the the argument of strategy is supposed to be like, once we realize why this is significant, um, we always have to ask ourselves if we want to apply a particular criterion for energy conservation, how it's addressing this sort of concern that. The, the the net zero flux condition might, uh, when it's violated, might be picking up on these extraneous things. And this is the source for why, uh, the reason why, like I'm suggesting this other sort of sort of criterion. Right, that, that's fair. Um, and I, I, I would have to say, well, like the different, <clears throat> you can tell the difference because if there has to be genuine non, non-zero curvature, um, in order for it to be the kind of thing that I'm trying to distinguish from a mirror, bad choice of coordinate type effect that you're pointing out. But that's not very satisfying and that's, that's yeah. the... I think on my part, I, I wanna develop a better argument for why the class of accelerating observers really should be understood as the same sort of thing as the curvature situation. Because right now the argument is a little bit like an argument by, it's a little bit of an IBE or a little bit of a, an, an or analogy. analogy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and 
I think I can give a better argument for this, but I haven't totally figured it out yet. Um, I'm also, if there's a <clears throat> connection to Mach's principle, which it seemed from your abstract, oh, I'd, like, right. I'd love to, to hear it. I know that we can't now. Oh, I, I, I took that slide out. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I can, uh, I've, got, I've got two minutes into it, and I'll be really brief. Um, so the idea is, is the following. Um, you might have thought that um, you know this earlier part of the paper where I talked about how the Riemann tensor is uh, determines and is determined by the pair of the Ricci tensor and the Weyl tensor. You might have thought that what that means is that somehow that um, the Ricci tensor is the part of space-time geometry that is the Machian part, like it's the part of space-time geometry that is determined by uh, that is determined by the distribution of matter, uh, and that somehow the the vial tensor is like in independent of it. The situation is a little bit more complicated though, because if that were the case, how could it be the case that the motion of matter generates gravitational waves? The motion of matter has to induce some sort of changes in the vial curvature in order for that to happen, and it turns out that if you observe, if you play around with the Bianchi identity and the contracted Bianchi identity, you can show that the um, effectively the change in the vial tensor is in turn determined by the change in the Ricci tensor and the change in the scalar curvature, which because of Einstein's equation is completely determined by the change in the energy momentum and the trace of the energy momentum. So what that means is that um, there's a sense in which the motion of matter determines certain as much more aspects of space-time geometry than you might have thought just by looking at the Einstein field equation. It doesn't determine everything, and so it's not like uh, a, a strong vindication of, of Mach, but at least like there's more aspects of, of space-time geometry that are determined from matter and the changes in matter than you might have initially expected. That's the main thing that I was going to add. Thanks. Mm -hmm.